Good morning. Welcome to United Methodist Church of Plano. Uh, we're glad you're joining us this morning. My name is Steve Saunders. I have the privilege of being the pastor here. Behind me you see our sanctuary. Unfortunately, the sun is uh, shining so bright through that stained glass window behind me, everything is pretty much bleached out. But it's a picture of Jesus being the good shepherd. And uh, we're here today, number one, to celebrate uh, that he is the good shepherd and to uh, find encouragement in his care for us. We've been going through the book of Ruth uh, for a few weeks now, and it always, for me, compares to Esther. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Esther today. We're not going to study the whole book, and in fact, I'm, I'm not going to read huge portions of it. I'm going to read a small portion of it. But Esther is a book that uh, had some difficulties when it came into the canon of Scripture because it never mentions God. You never hear um, any big treatise on God. We don't hear his word as such as many of the prophets would say, thus says the Lord but we see him quietly, powerfully working behind the scenes. We found that out yesterday as uh, we were studying the second chapter of Ruth, verses 8 through 16. And really the beginnings from chapter 1 all the way to where we ended yesterday, in chapter 2, verse 16, we, we seen how God had been working behind the scenes to care for Ruth and Naomi. That he'd been weaving this beautiful tapestry of love, redemption, and restoration in both of their lives. And that someday they would be restored. That Naomi, who left sweet and she said full, had returned to Bethlehem empty and changed her name from sweet or pleasant to Mara, which was bitter. I thought these two books coincide at a great time. They, they come together well. And I want to read a little bit of Esther here. And I'm going to set the stage. The book of Esther talks about a young woman who becomes queen of a powerful... Hey, Edna, good morning. Of a powerful... Kind of a... He's evil and uh, he's driven by pride He's not the smartest guy in the world. He may have been good at, as far as managing the kingdom in certain ways. But King Ahasuerus oh, wasn't, the, wasn't the sharpest leader around. And uh, had no problem spending money and having vast parties. And uh, one day, one of his leaders comes to him and, and asks that he would sign an edict, a, an order that... Uh, the Jewish people should be annihilated. This came from a guy named Haman. Mainly his anger came because another guy named Mordecai, a Jew who would not bow down to him. Mordecai is rock solid in his faith for the God of the God of creator. Yahweh Elohim El Shaddai Adonai. And he would bow to no other. And it infuriated Haman. So one day he came to the king and, and he got the king to sign this order. And any law signed uh, according to the Medes and the Persians, any law was unchangeable, was irrevocable. Whatever was written was written. In order to overturn that, hey Arlene, good morning. Over and Norris, the only way to overturn that would be to sign a new edict. The Jewish people were in serious trouble because they were facing annihilation. And this king had the wherewithal to make it happen. Mordecai tries to contact Queen Esther and tell her she has a role to play in saving the Jews. But she's reluctant. She's scared. And who could blame her? She was young. And that's a huge weight on her shoulders. Plus, she knew if the king hadn't called for her, she could be killed on the spot. She gives us a, a great way to handle difficult situations. She said, 
I and my maids will pray and fast. You also, Mordecai, gather the congregation and pray and fast for me as well. Whatever happens, happens. Well, the long story short is that there is a huge reversal. That even though God isn't mentioned, the Jewish people are saved. And I, I want to read a bit of how that happens. This is uh, Esther chapter 8, beginning in verse 9. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps, to the governors, and the officials of the providence. Now get this. From India to Ethiopia, 127 promises, pro provinces. This is seemingly impossible. They couldn't do it by email. They couldn't even do it by train or by automobile. To each province in its own script. So every province had its own language or own way of writing. Hey, Bob, good morning. And so these had to be written in 127, at least 127 different languages, maybe more, for each of their provinces or wherever they were going to land. It had to be done quickly. And also the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of, the, of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. And then he sent letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy and to kill and annihilate any armed forces of any people, province, or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On, on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adad, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province being publicly displayed to all the people, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on the swift horses and were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. Now, that seems like an impossible task, and we wonder how that's going to happen. But the Lord, in his power, managed to get that message out in seemingly no hope. He made a way where there was no way. That even though he's not mentioned, he is working behind the scenes. And for the Jewish people, their identity went from the annihilated to the rescued. Their, their identity went from being hated to being restored to their community. They were in fact not annihilated. And Mordecai, while not seeking anything special, he was elevated into the king's court as one of the king's advisors. And the person who wanted him dead and removed and the person who wanted Israel to be annihilated was he himself taken out by the king. I know you're asking, what in the world does that have to do with us today? While we don't have a physical enemy, we are in the middle of a crisis. But our identity doesn't have to be crisis. Our identity doesn't have to be fearful. Our identity can be resting in Christ. Who are you? I am resting in Christ. I'm not oblivious to the dangers and to the horrors of coronavirus, but our identity is in the Savior. So no matter what fear comes our way, fear is in our identity. Strength and safety in Christ is our identity. 
We have hope in hopeless situations because we have a great Savior. I want to read something, uh, a verse out of a song. One of my favorites is In Christ Alone, by, uh, written by Chris, Keith and Kristen Getty, I think, and one of my favorite versions comes from Avalon. But this is the last verse, and, and I, I want this to speak to our hearts this morning. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Now I know that's not the Bible and I don't preach out of songs or books. But that principle is exactly what's happening in Ruth and in Esther. Esther saw the scheme of a human being seeking to annihilate her people. But God made a way. Nothing could pluck them out of their enemy's hand except the Lord. And nothing could pluck them out of the Lord's hand. Do we die eventually? Do we see disaster? And do we have, live in a broken, sinful world? Yes. But there is one thing that we can cling to. No matter what happens, no matter what situation we're in, no matter how great things are or how terrible they are, nothing, like Paul said in Romans chapter 8, can ever separate us from the love of God. And that is probably one of my favorite verses in that song. That nothing can pluck us from the hand of Christ. That our destiny is held by Jesus. And at his command, we will walk through whatever he's called us to walk through. Right now, we walk through a time of uncertainty. But we can be certain of one thing. And that is that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, is our firm foundation. He will not lead us astray. He will not leave us empty. He will not leave us forsaken or alone. And that even a vicious virus like this can never separate us from his love. Today, loved ones, may you rest in the loving hand of Christ. May you surrender your fears and your anxieties to him. And may you be reminded that you are precious in his sight. That you are, especially if you are a Christian, you are a blood-bought son or daughter of the king. And not even death itself can separate us from Christ. I hope that that gives some of you encouragement today. Leave today reminded that you are the apple of your heavenly father's eye and your identity is son or daughter of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when the world seems to be upside down, when we seem to be shaken at our core, when we don't know where to turn, thank you that through the darkness, through the confusion, and through fear, we can see you, our Savior, our Protector, our Redeemer. Thank you that we can rest in you. Thank you that you've conquered everything in our life. And that nothing can take us away from you. For you have even told the Father... You have lost none whom you have given me. Thank you for that, Jesus. We love and praise you. We exalt you. And we pray all of this in your victorious name. Amen. Amen. Before we leave this morning, I want to leave you with something from the book of Jude. This is Jude chapter 24 through 25. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in Christ's name, who is in the glory of the Father, who is one with the Father, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. See you tomorrow, everyone.